All right, welcome to the conversation on the TYT Network. We're joined by a great journalist now, David Day, and he's executive editor of the American Prospect. He's also written a book about Wall Street. I say also because he just broke an amazing story about what the banks are doing with your stimulus check, and it has had an effect already. It has led to change, exactly the kind of journalism that we celebrate on the Young Turks. So, David, uh, great to see you again, brother. Good to see you, sir. So uh, let's start from the beginning, David. Uh, you first started writing about what the banks could do uh, with your stimulus check. So tell us about that, and then we'll talk about which banks responded and what kind of change we got. Absolutely. So uh, the key thing to know here is that when uh, certain federal benefits come to uh, an individual, like Social Security or veterans benefits or disability payments, uh, those are protected from private debt collectors. They, they flag the payments. And so uh, that disallows private debt collectors from taking uh, that money to offset any existing debt. And, and they do that for a good reason, because those benefits are given to people so that they can survive, so that they can eat, so that they can live for the next period of time. Uh, these stimulus payments that were approved in the CARES Act uh, were not coded that way. They are listed as tax credits, and tax credits are eligible for private debt collection. And nothing in the law said that these payments could be protected. So Congress did not add that into the equation. And uh, the Treasury Department has the ability under the law to write a rule and say, you know what, those are survival payments. Those are for food and medicine and necessities for struggling people during a pandemic. We can protect them, uh, but they did not. I obtained audio from a regulatory session between the Treasury Department and bank compliance officers. And what Treasury said on there was, hey, there's nothing in the law that precludes you guys, the banks, from taking that money uh, to offset an existing debt, whether it's a overdrawn account, a negative balance, uh, a consumer loan that the same individual has that uh, they're, they're laid on. So really, uh, they gave the green light to banks to use these payments to offset existing debts. And sure enough, that's just what happened. It is relatively easy to have said in the legislation that the banks cannot do this, but they chose not yep. to do it. It is easy in the legislation. Uh, in fact, uh, debt collection from federal or state agencies is prohibited within the law. Uh, everything but state supported, uh, state mandated child support payments, uh, the, the federal and state agencies who are collecting a debt cannot take these payments. For some reason, Congress did not extend that to private debt collectors. And that includes banks who have debts, uh, uh, you know, outstanding with individual uh, customers. And it includes private debt collectors who might have a garnishment order where they have a judicial ruling that says we can take money out of the bank account of somebody who owes us a debt. So both of those things are actually happening. I've been focusing on what banks are doing, but private debt collectors, as I understand it, are also garnishing the stimulus payments uh, uh, through these, uh, these garnishment orders. So David, uh, then did the banks actually start garnishing the checks and grabbing them before people had a chance uh, to use them? Well, they sure did. So the uh, these CARES Act payments started to come in through direct deposit last week. And uh, I've uh, heard from people uh, with numerous instances of banks who uh, decided to take those to offset negative balances. Uh, a lot of these come in through overdraft. You know, you get hit by $35 charges if you're overdrawn on your account. They can really add up. And uh, so this was significant chunks, in some cases, all of uh, these Stimulus Act payments. The perhaps worst story that I heard involved USAA Bank. And USAA is a financial institution that serves veterans and military families. And uh, I heard from a family who uh, it, the, the husband was a veteran who was injured while serving. Uh, she, uh, the wife is uh, a daycare teacher who was fired because of the COVID-19 
crisis. They have two young children. So they were eligible for $3,400 in CARES Act payments. And uh, they had a dispute with USAA about a year ago where they incurred these charges, about $8,000 in charges. They say it was because of fraud on the account. USAA said it, uh, they could not determine fraud, so they wanted that money. And uh, what happened is the family closed the account and they went to bank somewhere else. Uh, and USAA did what they call charge off. They charged off the account. And what that means, it's just a technical term that means we don't expect to ever collect any money off of this debt that we have on the account. We're not going to close it. We'll keep it open in case something happens. But we charged it off. And so because that was the account that was listed in the IRS direct deposit information, the, uh, the $3,400 went into that USAA account and USAA took it. And, uh, you know, you can track where the payments are on the IRS website. The couple found that USAA had their, their money. They called up. Uh, they were told that they shouldn't have gotten into debt in the first place. Uh, and they were told that, that what the USAA does is they reduce these balances uh, if new money comes into the account. And they were not an isolated incident. I heard from several USAA members who had this happen to them. Uh, and the USAA admitted to me that that was their policy of, of using these stimulus payments to offset existing debt. So I wrote the story last week uh, about USAA and, and there was a, quite a bit of public outcry, particularly from USAA uh, customers. And within several hours, they decided to reverse their policy and refund everybody who they took payments from, including the uh, couple that I talked about, the disabled veteran and his wife, uh, and the $3,400 they were due. Uh, that is 100% because of your story. Um, it would not have happened without that story. So, But let's talk about the other aspects of what created the pressure for them, uh, because banks and other powerful interests don't often listen to progressive journalists. There, um, did uh, other uh, veteran groups come in uh, to put pressure on them? Paul Rykoff's group, uh, uh, Common Defense, uh, did, did pick this up. I should say that the New York Times also reported out this story and found some USAA members. So uh, there, there was, you know, uh, uh, several people who were working on this. Um, you know, I, I thought it was quite brazen that, that USAA just sort of admitted to me that this is what they were going to do. This was their policy. Uh, so it didn't really take much journalism. You just write down what they said and uh, present it to people and people self-evidently saw it as horrifying. And what I heard the most you know, through social media and, and, and through contacts with me were people who were 20-year, 25-year, 30-year members of USA saying, I'm going to cancel my account if you don't turn this around. And, and you know, I do think that that it's not progressive journalism. It's their own customers that get the attention of, of, of a bank like USAA. Right. But if it's not in the media, uh, those people would usually suffer alone, not realizing it's happening to other people and not be able to effectuate change. So uh, now let's talk about other banks. Uh, have other banks also uh, garnished people's stimulus checks? Yes, absolutely. Um, uh, uh, another uh, minor success story is a company called Radius Bank. Uh, a customer there uh, just made a query asking, uh, what is your policy regarding these, these payments? And uh, the customer service rep said, yeah, we will reduce them uh, if, if it's, there's a negative balance on the account. And I asked Radius Bank about it, didn't hear back, wrote the story uh, that Radius Bank was another one that was, was uh, poised to take these payments. And then Radius Bank got back to me and said they, they would reverse it, uh, the, the change the policy. Uh, U.S. Bank, which is one of the largest in the country, the fifth largest commercial bank in the country, uh, they were taking payments until uh, we contacted them. Uh, they reversed it, but in kind of a, a, a weird way. They said, well, we will not cause any charges to any accounts for overdraft after passage of the CARES Act. Well, I talked to some people who had overdraft charges prior to that, uh, and they, were they still have not been able to retrieve their money from U.S. Bank uh, uh, you know, uh, involved with 
uh, payments that were uh, overdraft fees that were given you know, before passage of the CARES Act. So um, this is not just uh, are there other banks, this is still ongoing. And uh, really, those three are the tip of the iceberg. This is really at the discretion of, of every bank in America. And there are about 4,500 of them. I'm only one guy. I haven't called all of them. But this is still at their discretion. The Treasury has the ability to protect these payments. They have decided not to do so. And so it's every bank for themselves. And uh, they could you know, decide that... Uh, Nobody's going to catch them and, and they can take the reputational risk and they can just go ahead and do this. Uh, I, I don't know why they would for, you know, a relatively small amount of money in the greater scheme of things for them. But a vital uh, payment and amount of money for an individual. Uh, but uh, th this appears to still be happening and it, it will continue to happen until uh, Congress or the Treasury Department fixes this. Yeah, well, I know why they do it. It's a, a culture created by the stock market that you must maximize profit. It's also what fiduciary responsibility, they would say. And so the culture is take, 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 take everything you can possibly take from your own customers. Right. Uh, and the other, so, the other thing I would say, and this is not a defense of banks because I would never do that, is that, you know, a lot of these systems are automated. So a payment comes into an account that has a negative balance and they just take the payment. I mean, that's just what's done because the payment isn't flagged. The payment isn't, it, there's nothing attached to the payment that associates it any differently from a regular tax refund, right? It, it just comes in from the, from the IRS, just says IRS payment on it. So they reverse it. So it takes some doing for them to get their systems up and running and to realize, oh, these are the, the stimulus payments that are supposed to go towards people's food and, and, and medicine and necessities uh, and, and figure that out. So I'll, give, I'll cut them a little bit of slack. But when they say it's their policy to take this money, that's when I, I get a little furious about this whole situation because – uh, the, these, you know, the, the, the couple that lost $3,400 initially from USAA, they said that money was going to rent and that money was going to medicine for their young child. So that's what you're taking out of the hands of people when you, a bank, decides to take these payments. So I know that your systems are automated. It might be hard on you at first, but, uh, you know, either figure it out or pressure Treasury to do the right thing so you're not at risk of, of being made to look ridiculous by, by some journalists. The Treasury uh, that uh, is causing the problem in the first place, uh, that's run by Steve Mnuchin, uh, and he is fairly famous for bank fraud, uh, and obviously got to be Treasury Secretary by fighting bank fraud effectively. Oh no, right, by committing bank fraud, that's right. Got my stories mixed up for a second. Uh, so tell us about Mnuchin's backstory, which might inform why he's made this decision. Well, weirdly, I wrote a book called Fat Cat, the Steve Mnuchin story. I co-wrote it with uh, a, a writer named Rebecca Burns, and it came out last year uh, that, that sort of, you know, prefigured this. Uh, Mnuchin, uh, before becoming Treasury Secretary, he, he bought a failed lender called IndyMac, renamed it One West Bank, and they were one of the most notorious banks during the last economic crisis we had, the foreclosure crisis and the financial crisis, uh, they would foreclose on borrowers who had as little as uh, 27 cent missing in their in their monthly payment. Uh, they, they foreclosed on 102 year old uh, widows. Uh, they, they were ruthless and uncompromising and they committed fraud in, in the uh, actual uh, conduct, conduct of these foreclosures. Uh, I reported on uh, a letter uh, that was a memo from the California Attorney General's office that found widespread misconduct in the prosecution of foreclosures by One West Bank, which Mnuchin uh, uh, put together. And, uh, you know, he, the, the bank was not prosecuted. Kamala Harris was the AG at the time, the Attorney General, chose not to prosecute. Uh, but there's pretty hard evidence in this memo of thousands of violations of California foreclosure law, and that's, of course, just California. So, uh, you know, yeah. A corporate Democrat letting off a Republican banker that donated 
uh, and is and is a consistent donor. Hmm, that seems awfully weird, David. I, I'm not sure I've ever seen a case like that. All right, in all seriousness, let's talk about that because it, it actually does play a role here. If there's no control from the opposing party, from the Democratic Party, of course uh, bankers who committed fraud become Treasury secretaries, which then allows uh, for banks to take your money without checking with you because that's what he does for a living. So why didn't Kamala Harris prosecute uh, Steve Mnuchin when it seemed that it was clear fraud that he'd committed? She, she's never given a good answer on that. Uh, the best answer that she's given is uh, that we looked at the evidence and this was a decision that my office made as if she had no agency in the decision, like it was the office furniture that made the decision or something. Uh, it makes absolutely no sense. But um uh, it, it, there's there's never been a satisfactory answer to that, and uh, and as a result, as you say, this is someone who could have been disgraced by all the fraud that his bank was committing. Instead, he becomes the Treasury Secretary. Uh, my reporting shows that Mnuchin was made aware of this situation in a phone call with Sherrod Brown, who's the chair or the ranking Democrat on the Senate Banking Committee on April 1st. It, it, you know, this is three weeks ago, uh, going on three weeks ago, uh, that he knew that this was a problem and that this was going to happen. And uh, Mnuchin on that call said he was unaware of the situation at that point, which is a week after the CARES Act passed. So he didn't even know, even though he negotiated the CARES Act, he didn't even know that this was uh, a possibility and uh, clearly has done nothing about it since. Uh, meanwhile, we have all these stories. Now, the Washington Post reported today that the Treasury Department is now looking into this, even though they knew about it for almost three weeks. Uh, clearly, the, uh, the, the, the public pressure is sort of getting to them a little bit. But, uh, you know, these are Mnuchin's friends, let's face it. Uh, the, the, the banking industry uh, is as people that he associates with. He has you know, taken a very bank friendly line while uh, at Treasury in terms of regulations, cutting back on on various regulations under the Dodd-Frank law. And, uh, you know, this is just another example of being uh, far more uh, giving and generous to the banks than to uh, the actual people uh, who, who need these payments. So I want to stay on the, the loyal opposition for a second, but I, I don't want to be too glib. So real quick. I mentioned in passing a donation from uh, Mnuchin to Kamala Harris. Did he donate to Kamala Harris? Yes. Yes, he did. Uh, and, and, uh, that was for her first attorney general campaign, which I believe was in 2010. Uh, this memo that I got was, uh, I believe, sometime around 2013, although that number might be wrong. I don't quite remember. But it was in the first term that uh, Mnuchin donated to get Harris in the office. So Kamala Harris right now, one of the top uh, potential picks for uh, Joe Biden uh, for VP if uh, she's on the ticket. Well, there goes any criticism of Steve Mnuchin. Uh, I mean, not just in this particular case, David, uh, with this story that you broke, but would the Biden-Harris team have a leg to stand on if they were to criticize how the Treasury has handled any of these bailouts? Banking uh, in general uh, hasn't exactly been Joe Biden's strong suit. Um, and, uh, you know, we have a, a bailout uh, that is being conducted through the Treasury Department and the Federal Reserve that is just absolutely massive. I mean, what are we talking about here? We're talking about $1,200 per person payments to individuals. So that's $1,200. Uh, the Treasury Department has put together a $4.5 trillion lending fund. The Federal Reserve has put it together. They're using $450 billion uh, from the Treasury that was approved in the CARES Act uh, to, to aim that cannon at the largest corporations in America. This is a wildly disproportionate response. Uh, there are very few strings attached to that money. And uh, we have individuals fighting with their banks for $1,200 while Boeing or um, American or United Airlines or some giant hotel chain or some giant restaurant chain is going to walk up to the Federal Reserve, say, 
put their hand out and 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 get mountains of cash thrown into it uh, at at their heart's desire. So uh, the the disproportionality of this response is uh, is very important. Uh, it, it's worth scrutiny. Uh, and you know, if you have uh, uh, a, a treasury secretary who once donated to someone on the ticket on the Democratic side, it does tend to to hinder what that response can be. And this is part of why we have government that's out of control, because we have one side that's out of control, another side that institutionally is not used to checking them. So it leaves it up to journalists like David to break the story. I'm glad the New York Times followed up. I'm glad the Washington Post followed up. That doesn't often happen. So it's great that they did. So I, I guess let's leave it uh, uh, on, on the last question of what to do going forward. Obviously, pressure, treasury, we get that. But if you're a consumer out there and, and you've got money in Bank of America or wherever it is, how can you make sure that, that your bank, whichever one it is, is not going to garnish it? You, you, should, you should let me know. <laughs> you, should, you should email me. Um, uh, contact your, your members of Congress uh, who would want to know about this. And they've obviously been responding uh, to some of their constituents having this happen to them. Uh, I believe even Harris has written a letter to Mnuchin about this situation. So, um, uh, you know, it, it's recognized that this payment was intended by Congress to go to you. So, uh, uh, you know, contact whoever you can that you think might be able to, to get the word out about this, because obviously what we've seen is that banks are a bit responsive to pressure on this particular issue. Uh, everybody check out uh, David's great work at the American Prospects, support the American Prospects so they could do work like this. Uh, and thank you uh, for, for your uh, excellent reporting on this, David. Really appreciate it. Okay, Jenk, thank you very much. The TYT Plus app is now available on iOS and Android. Download to get more TYT content at tyt.com slash app.